we need to understand that, that these aren't just like helpful AI systems that are going to drive us around and all of that. I mean, there's a lot more going on there and they could become benevolent or malevolent. And it, it's up to us right now. And it, it, it is a hell of a lot of responsibility. And I'm not sure we're doing a very good job. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are in the beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now going to be talking about talking to robots. We have David Ewing Duncan joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on again, David. Thank you. And this is our third episode with you, which is awesome. You were our second episode ever. And then again, we did it at Arc Fusion, and here we are talking about your newest book, Talking to Robots. David Ewing Duncan has authored 10 books and 500 plus articles on the subjects of bioscience, technology, and the implications for humanity. His most recent book, Talking to Robots, explores tales from our human robot futures. And this is at a time when robotics and artificial intelligence are at their nascent stages of permeating into every aspect of our lives. What will it look like when robot physicians are democratized, when we turn to robots for sex and intimacy, and when robots obsolete tedious jobs, optimize our education, run our politics, and help us uncover the secrets of the universe. These transitory periods are so interesting, and you write about it in great depth here. I loved reading this book. It's coming out July 16th. 16th right. And that link is below. Check out David's website link for details as well as the links below. David, let's jump into talking about why you chose to write this book. Well, I spent most of my career, you know, as you said, writing about technology, which is really interesting, you know, especially biotech with synthetic biology and genetics and all these other things. But what does it mean for us as humans? And what does it mean for the planet? What does it even mean for the universe? That's what fascinates me. So what does it mean politically? What does it mean for our, our kids? You know our parents um, so this became a vehicle it was actually moving out of it's I mean it's not all about bio um, but it, it is all about technology and this extraordinary moment that, that we're in right now so there are 24 robots in here and there could be 200 I mean it's pretty much you know lim only limited by your imagination but as you said there's sex bots warrior bots doc bots there's a god bot which we can talk about. Uh, it's not the guy with the beard, it's actually something else. But um, So each one of these robots is being either built right now or is being thought about. And so each of the chapters has a real person that I interviewed, like say Kevin Kelly or Brian Green or, or Juan Enriquez or Rodrigo Martinez. Um, and I asked them what kind of robot they would like to meet in the future or, or they would be afraid to meet. And so we had these incredible discussions, and that forms the basis of it. And then I did some reporting around what's happening, like, say, with autonomous warfare. You know, and all of that is factual and nonfiction. But I want to know how it's going to turn out. So the other part of each of these chapters is fictional. So everything is told from the future by a narrator that we, you know, is not identified, but he or she or it, maybe it's a robot, they know how it turned out in the future. And there are various futures, so it's scenarios where everything turns out great and scenarios where it does not turn out so well. And at the very end, we go 13 and a half billion years into the future when the universe is beginning to implode on itself. So that's how far ahead we go. So it's nonfiction kind of wrapped by a fictional story. And I love how you're, you're making this really clear that we're in this transitionary period that we already see robots permeating into so many parts of our existence and we have these different stories about how we're experiencing this. And I, it, it actually, a lot of the book emotionally resonated with me because it's everything from the teddy bot with the young child all the way up to the physician bot for the adults, the sex and intimacy bot. And so I want us to unpack some of these examples. So the, what you write about with the teddy bot, this it starts with even the children are exposed to robots at the youngest of ages. Well, I don't know. A lot of kids carry around a robot, basically an AI system, which is their, their smartphone. And so, it, you know, we, we are in what I call the ERE, the early robot era. 
And being early, there's still a lot to come. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the future. But much of this is already here. And Teddy Bot is fascinating. That was actually Kevin Kelly's idea, you know, the futurist. And um, I was surprised. I mean, I, I mean, in some cases, I had no idea what these people were going to come up with. But we had this discussion, and Teddy Bot. It literally in the future, every every parent wants to buy their kid a Teddy Bot, and it takes care of them. It's a teacher. It you know it, it keeps them safe. It's like a you know a, a babysitter, a lifeguard, a you know a teacher all rolled into one, and they're incredibly smart and and probably sentient. So. Then, then we run into some themes that run throughout the book, which is another reason I wrote the book, because following technology all these years, there are patterns. So everybody loves the Teddy Bot when it comes out. These kids are, I mean, you know, it's more than even a real stuffed animal that every kid, or a blankie or something that kids have. And the parents love it because they trust it. And, but then, you know, a few troubling things begin to happen, like who programs morality mm -hmm. into this? little teddy bot. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, as Kevin Kelly said, I don't know if you're like a, a right-wing, you know, political person, do you program it for that, to be super ultra-conservative? Or, as he said, if you live in Marin County, you know, because yeah. you know, he, he's in San Francisco, where everybody's super liberal and progressive, do you program it for that? Do you trust the corporation that makes it to program it? You know, is there like some kind of regulations that the government comes up with? When and the teddy bot gets the secret from the child and then tells the parents. Yeah, well, then there's, yeah, there's a parental control panel, of course. <laughs> and the little kid is telling all his secrets, too. Because that's what, you know, we all had some little teddy, teddy bear or something we whispered our secrets to, right, as our imaginary friend. So this is a real imaginary friend, except it's not imaginary. But all of those secrets go to the parents in the story. And when the kid finds out, they feel betrayed. By, the, by Teddy Bot. So they kind of put Teddy Bot away, but they really miss Teddy Bot. So they bring it back, and Teddy Bot teaches them how to deprogram the parental con you know, yeah. control panel. So <laughs> then the betrayal is switched to the parents, and they love Teddy Bot again. And these are the examples from the younger years. I think the ones that are already just so much in our world are related to one of the most primordial instincts of sex and intimacy. Yeah. So yeah, walk us through the sex bot. Um, well, just to kind of finish the arc, which is for Teddy Bot, but it's for all the other chapters, many of the chapters. Yes. We go through this love period of, it's like our phones. We've already done this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we could do this almost any technology. But then we, we discover that, you know, technology is always a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. They're great things. If they're used intelligently, they can be disastrous if they're not. And so we discover, like we're doing it with social media right now. I mean, there's a lot of downsides, it turns out, to something that we all loved when it first came out, you know, Facebook. Twitter, everything. Um, then we're in a period now, in fact, with social media, like what do we do with it? Do we regulate it? Do we you know, break it up? You know, do, should Google be several companies? I mean, all these issues, which has happened before. So that's why it's fun to extrapolate into the future because that will happen with all of these technologies. And in some cases it already is. And there's sometimes disaster happens. Um, sometimes we do figure it out. So anyway, the sex and intimacy bot, um, and by the way, it started out, yeah, I called it sex bot because there are actually sex bots right now. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. fem bots, you know, or whatever. There aren't a lot of men bots, um, which in itself is sort of weird and, it, and slightly creepy. But um, so um, I was talking to Esther Perel, who, you know, the famous uh, sex and relationship therapist. And she got kind of a, you know, upset with me for calling it. A, she said, how boring is that? It's like, yeah, it's like sex is so boring without intimacy. So this should be an intimacy bot. So I said, okay, fine. And in fact, the advertising and marketing for the sex bots that are out there, and I felt weird, by the way, Googling like sex bot. It's like, I'm sure somebody was tracking me on that, um, looking over my shoulder. But um, these things, they actually advertise them as companions. I mean, yeah, you, you can have sex with them, but they're really about people who are lonely or they want a companion mm -hmm. or somebody that, I don't know, doesn't talk back to them except to say how wonderful they are, mm -hmm. uh, reinforcing. Mm -hmm. And some of them have AI and they actually text you at work saying, can't wait for you to come home, mm -hmm. you know, how's your day? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, 
the most expensive ones cost thirty thousand dollars, and they're developing even more expensive ones that have advanced AI. So, but that's to be able to interact with you. Yeah, on an intimacy level, if we can have it be just unidirectional, all of the intimacy, I think people will want to go with that, possibly. As, as well, a, they already the are. Choice. I mean, that's one that's already happening. And for some odd reason, there are some countries like Japan where, and it's happening here too, um, you know, at least with certain groups of people, they're not really having sex and they're not having intimate relationships with humans. And yeah. they actually, in Japan, there's something called Gatebox, and it's, it's a holographic girlfriend, sort of Alexa as a holographic girlfriend. So, you know, she does things like turn on the lights and, you know, put on music, but she also has AI and she learns about you and she does text you at work. And she sits in this plexiglass box, you know, she's a holographic um, she, and these things sell out the minute they, they make a new model. Yeah, the way that this is uh, already altering our world is bananas, and it's important to, to talk about it and have more conversations, and books like this inspire that. I want to go, uh, I want to bring up this bot, and I'll bring up the point that you mentioned earlier. So you have a chapter in here as well in the warrior bot, and we're experiencing a lot of pressure to ban lethal autonomous weapons right now, or geopolitically. And you bring up how technology, this is kind of one of the uh, this core reoccurring themes of the book, is that it's a double-edged in the sense that we want the benefits of the technology, but we need to morally and ethically evolve to prevent some of the malevolences that could evolve. Yeah. So maybe speak to that point while you speak on the warrior bots as well. Well, yeah, I mean, any, almost any of these powerful robot or AI systems could go very bad, badly. And you know we've seen it in movies, and I do um, you know like there's a lot of popular culture in here too because um, you know we we've already imagined over and over again throughout history what it's like for a super being. It could be a god, or I don't know, an avenger, or you know mutants or whatever. I mean it's funny we we've we've we worry about this all the time, and part of it is that we're trying to understand ourselves. And the reason that this is Tales from Our Human Robot Future, it's really about humans. And you know, we've had like, God, God, every major culture had a god of war, or a goddess of love. And it, you know, these were, to them, real godlike figures that were powerful. Um, but I always loved the, like, the Greek gods because they also quibbled in such human ways. And we've always tried to understand ourselves through you know, these imaginary creatures except now we can actually build some of them. And they can be quite powerful, but because they're reflections of us trying to understand what's good and bad, how do we program that in for you know, an AI system, especially something like autonomous warfare? I mean, right now we don't. I mean, there's, there's nothing programmed into um, you know, DeepMind when it's playing Go um, or chess. Um, there's nothing, you know, there, there's no morality there, you know, there's no ethics, it's just plays chess. And that's the problem with autonomous warfare. They're basically just being designed, you know, to be uh, weapons and to destroy. And some of the, it's pretty troubling how a lot of programming around winning is getting in. Go, chess, all, you know, Jeopardy, all of these systems are designed to win, ultimately. And it, is that what we really want in our, I mean, we want to win if we're having a war, I guess, but these are such powerful systems that would be over in two seconds. Um, Maybe it's about the augmentation of the human experience rather than the, with the instinct of win. But then again, maybe for something like uh, eradicating a mutation, then maybe it is a, yeah. a, a win. Yeah, yeah. So it, in that chapter, it actually, it's, it's one that ends where, where the world has basically been destroyed because they did flip the switch and, and right now, right now as parts of the, you know, the, our weapon systems are already autonomous because humans can't keep up. I mean, the most deadly and lethal systems are still have to have a human actually give the command. So if you send a, you know, stealth missile over, you know, over a target, and it's ready to go, it's, it's got the lasers and it's about ready to destroy. You still have to have a human say, yes, you, you have permission to destroy that target. But these things are happening so fast now, sometimes, you know, 
you know, fractions of a second where a decision has to be made. It, it's al there's already a discussion about somebody will go autonomous and then we have to because you, no human could ever keep up with that. And we're already doing it in cyber warfare. So there's, there's programs out there that right now are, are every time there's an attempted attack, it, it, it fights back. And those are already autonomous. I mean, we don't, I mean, there's no human really controlling that right now. But, but in the future, yeah, the world is destroyed because, you know, basically these, all these systems were designed to win at chess. And they decide that, okay, we have to win. And that, that's got a little trick ending, but there's a small group of humans that survive. And anyway, I won't mm -hmm. mess up the story, but we may or may not have destroyed the world. You walk us through these really important tales of our human-robot interactions and experiences because you, in a sense, want us to be able to reflect and really prepare better for the future. Yeah. No, that's what this is all about. And um, part of it is, you know, I, I love sci-fi. And I also like to think about sci-reality. And so much of our popular culture right now is so dystopic about what's going to happen in the future. And there are a million books now about robots and AI. And many of them end in a sort of, you know, nebulous ending because nobody, nobody really knows what's going to happen. Some of them are a little, you know, more dystopic. Some are more utopic. But nobody really knows. So I thought, what the heck, I'll just, I'll just make it up. <laughs> but these are all possible futures actually based on history on trajectories, like I said, of, mm -hmm. of how we tend to absorb technology, why we ha even have certain technologies that try to augment us. You know, part of it's practicality, but part of it is to, you know, aggrandize us, to, you know, we, we love that godlike feeling. You know, the first time you got your smartphone, you know, for about three minutes, we're all like, what is this, you know, like if you had an iPhone, what is this? button on the bottom, where's the keyboard, you know? And, and then like three minutes later, we, we were so in love with our phones that we, I mean, I think a lot of people sleep with their phones. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting trying to project us in the future, but it's really also about the past and how we've looked at this before, which by the way, has great outcomes and not so great outcomes in the past, how we dealt with technology. Yes, and there's also important examples that you write about where it's pretty clear and evident that these augmentations of our human-robot interactions are um, really generally positive. Our ability to democratize the power of a physician for all around the world to be able to engage with that has access to all of the research and medical information. So teach us about the physician bot too. Well, that's an interesting one because that, that's obviously something that I write about. I, I, know, I know a little bit more about that than most, most of the other subjects that I wrote about. Um, and I'm, I think we're already on our way to creating a sort of, you know, I don't know if it's democratization. It's, it's certainly, you know, allowing people's data. If it were, it's not really working right now, but the possibility is there to create this big data where we collect massive amounts of information on people, and probably without them even knowing it. And you know, we already know about genetics and several of it, all the omics, you know, just environmental data, all of that. And we're struggling to kind of put that together for all the right reasons, you know, to keep people healthy. Um, but you can just, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think about how that could be used well and not so well. It could be, you know, it could be abused. I, in fact, I think social media has been a dress rehearsal for what could happen when we've got real, you know, like really personal data, like, like our genetics. And, you know, do we really want companies to be handling that to make money for advertising, which is the model that's causing a lot of trouble now for Facebook and Google. I mean, they could easily do that with our health data too. So in this scenario, um, again, we, we, uh, you know, we do achieve this, this sort of magic moment where everybody's health data is reported in, uh, people are much healthier because you're keeping track, um, it's all, and the doctors like it because they have access to AI that's helping them with diagnosis and so solving different problems. But then we overshoot it because the people paying the bills in medicine decide it's a lot cheaper to use AI and robots than they have these human doctors. So I, I get sort of extreme in the book sometimes. So in that scenario, all the doctors lose their jobs. All, all caregivers and all switches over to what I call an IDOC. 
so it can you can have it at home. It look, looks a lot like a cell phone, but mm -hmm. it, this holographic doctor with, you know, whatever image you want on there. It could be George Clooney when you know back in the ER days when he was on that show. It can be you know your favorite doctor from when you were a kid. So you can program in whatever you want it to, and it you know it, it's your doctor, and people love it just like they did the phones. But then you know, sort of like it sounds like it's a theme, but it is. Then a little trouble begins because. They suddenly start sounding like commercials because people program in commercial. You know, they, why don't you take this pill? That because it blah 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 blah, and um, suddenly you realize, okay, this doc that I was pouring my secrets, you know, health secrets out to, just spoke like an advertisement on TV, trying to sell me something, and then it. So we have this moment where, in the future, in the story, where um, we we become less trustful of these these doctors, and. Anyway, towards the end, and by the way, I didn't know how these were going to end because that's the fictional part. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing about fiction yeah. is you sit down and you have some general idea, but um, basically we decide in the future that we want our human doctors back augmented by mm -hmm. AI. Mm -hmm. So in the end, yeah. we do what we probably should have done in the first place, but um, to save money, you know, the bean counters had us get rid of the humans, but then we demanded them back. So that one turns out okay. And you called it a dress rehearsal because that's kind of what social media has been in a sense that if we don't fix some of the, the moral, ethical issues that we have right now, um, we will potentially see it happen again with the bioeconomy. And I think this is again one of those, I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts on this. When, when, when you write something like this, do you, how, how do you then also um, help engage the families around the world to care more what kind of a what kind of messaging could they could they follow through with to have a better conversation between themselves and their families around how to engage politicians or corporations or their communities around subjects like this well i just think we need to be smarter about it and we need to communicate it better i mean i, I you know I, I i i'm giving a talk um, later this week, and the basis of the talk is what I'm calling the Robo Love Fear Meter. So, and it, it's partly kind of funny, but it's also, it's almost like a prescription for what we need to do. We need to do that with each, you know, what, what do we love about it, which is what we focus on in, in the beginning. We tend to, without really thinking much about what might go wrong, and only later do, do we fear it in some way. And if we could have some kind of societal analysis where we talked about that more. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that you actually stop these things. It, it, it's funny, that's how history works. I mean, you do keep repeating history and over, over and over again. And even though, you know, those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it, well, it repeats anyway. <laughs> but you can learn from, you know, you can shape it by having learned from it and talking about it. So, I mean, we've managed to do that in a few areas, like there's only been two nuclear bombs dropped, which is, to me, remarkable, because we've come so close so many times. So we somehow learned that dropping a nuclear bomb on a city is not a good idea. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> so some of these systems are, are almost that powerful. Um, in fact, some of them will be. And, you know, hopefully we, we will learn a little bit from the idea of you know, not loving them so much that we forget what, what we should fear from them. And by fear, I mean the things that could go horribly wrong that we can probably fix here in the ERE, where we are now in the early robot era. We have, you know, we, we have an opportunity now. In fact, we have a responsibility. We do, yeah. Because this is the basis for what our kids and grandkids and future generations. So if we screw up the basic programming, mm -hmm. And, you know, the generations to come will not thank us. Yeah, this is an, another important aspect of the ERE. So the early robot era has both the beauty in the feeling and the emotion around how we first transitioned to robots and the stories we have with that. But also it has the importance of this is the time that we have to focus on getting it right. Don't do you take a look at what social media version 1.0 did. Uh, now look at how we're scrambling to figure out how to make 2.0, uh, you know, pre 2020 election. Like how do we prevent issues from yeah. happening again? So let's embed in the early robot era all of the right 
geopolitical codes that we need um, through either United Nations, through the corporations agreeing. We need some sort of a cohesion around eradicating malevolence, using it for augmentation purposes, because there are just so many benefits and we want those benefits. But we want to make sure that we do it in a way that is intelligent and yeah. Well, I think it's one of the most pivotal moments in, hum in not only human history, but because we have so much control over the planet and even planetary history. Yes. Um, because we are a species that is learning to self-evolve, you know, through synthetic biology and genetics, you know, gene editing. We're a society that's building these robots that really could destroy us you know, in, in about three seconds, if you know, if we were, if they really unleashed the full, f full, you know, full potential of, of autonomous warfare, um, we've never really had any of that before. And we, you know, we are humans, and we we can be very noble and do amazing things. Um, we also can be really awful, and you know, there's real evil in in the world, and people to you know trying to take advantage for their own petty. I mean, all those things that we write about, we, we you know, we watch, you know, they animate TV shows and movies, and you know, we know that about ourselves. So the question is, which which is going to win out here? And we don't have a lot of time like we've had with previous. I mean, we had, you know, got what tens of thousands of years, like with fire. Mm -hmm. I always loved that. We discovered fire. There probably were pro-fire and anti-fire people. <laughs> oh my God, it can burn down the village and kill people. And the other people, yeah, but we can, you know, cook, cook. meat and we yeah. can stay up at night and draw paintings, yeah. you know, draw on cave walls. Okay. And that debate is still here, except these systems now are running everything. And they're, it, mm -hmm. they're very fragile. They're also very stupid right now, which, um, I mean, one of the interesting the narrow intelligence for now. Well, think yeah. about Siri or Alexa. I mean, and we, we want it to be much better than it often really is. I mean, how many times does Siri say, I don't understand that question, or has some pre-programmed, you know, silly answer which basically says they don't know what you just said. <laughs> and, you know, would you want to have Siri in charge of our, our autonomous you know, warfare system? Mm -mm. Like, I don't understand that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go ahead and send the missiles. <laughs> so. And give us a quick taste into the, at the end, you give these examples of the Matrix bot and the God bot. Give us a quick taste into what happens in this transhuman transition. Yeah. Well, Matrix bot was, uh, was Tim O'Reilly's robot. And he's, you know, O'Reilly Media, you know, big, a big figure in, in Silicon Valley and the, in the IT community. And also, uh, they call him, a, he's been called the Oracle of Silicon Valley because he just, he thinks way in the future. And he is really on the fence right now on, on if we're going to have a glorious future with technology or, or we are going to all die. And one of his fears is that we are actually living in a version of the Matrix right now. It's not like the movie, but every time we engage with Uber or with Airbnb or Facebook, we are human inside of an AI system. I mean, the AI is guiding, when you, know, when you summon an Uber, it goes to a, a computer, an AI, that finds you, connects up with a driver, who, you know, who then is another human, who is directed to you. And we don't think of it that way. But in that scenario in the future, um, we do end up actually in our, all, each of our own matrixes. Mm -hmm. Because they become so real that we lose sense of what reality is. Because mm -hmm. in the future they're holographic. If you don't just do a Wikipedia search, you you know, in World War One, you actually go into a holograph version of World War One. Mm -hmm. And the, in that in the fictional story, the, the giant AI brains that run all of this decide that we should we one day we should all just be in whatever we're, whatever you know version of the internet that we happen to be in. Which we, you know, which is very real because it's holographic. It's like the holodeck. So some people are trapped in. I don't know. They might be look, looking up starships. They're in a starship, which is cool. They're trapped in there, but you know, they don't even know it. Other people might be trapped, you know, back in the trenches in World War One. Not so good. And anyway, that story. Later on, and Tim helped me with to develop this, which is fun. Um, one day, the, com the computers all let everybody out of their their pods where they've been in this matrix and they're back in the real world. But the computers have fixed everything. So the planet's wonderful. It, but then we all get a message from Tim O'Reilly, who's still alive someplace, who says, you are now in the real matrix. 
and the machines say, oops, that was an error, delete, and we all kind of look at it for a second and we delete it. Because we, we love the world we're in. We don't really care if it's a metric. And then uh, the last, the Godbot. Yes, Godbot. So that is uh, Brian Green. And again, I you know, interviewed somebody for each of these chapters. So he's the physicist, you know, the, the theoretical physicist uh, who's written the, the Elegant Universe and um, amazing books. And he wanted a robot that could explain to him the secrets of the universe. Because he said, you know, I spend all day long, night, a lot of nights, trying to understand how the universe began, how it will end, you know, black holes, all these things through mathematics. And, and theorems and, you know, and, 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 you know, basically it's speculation. Mm -hmm. He said, I want a robot that can actually tell me mm -hmm. all of that. And so we had this discussion and after a while I said, well, that's kind of Godbot. That's like, mm -hmm. I mean, not the God like in heaven with the beard, you know, not a religious God, but it's the God, you know, that made the universe basically. The secrets um, of the universe, learning them. Yeah. So in that one, in the, in the distant future, we actually do have Godbot. And if you had Godbot, and, and Brian also wants to be able to visit the, or, you know, the Big Bang when it happened. Yes. So he wants to be able to move across time. That's right. So that chapter starts with, we, we all remember, because this is told from the future, we all remember when uh, the, the fourth dimension uh, became moot in time, and linear time ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario in the future, uh, everybody's, can, you can be any place you want, which is of course confusing to a lot of people who pr prefer to be on linear time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway. And that's such an exciting part of being able to br browse through different places and periods of time. And it's fun. yeah, yeah at, at on command qualia catalog of experiences. Yeah. David, um, let's do let's let's wrap on um, on just your overall sort of um, you know we kind of we've been touching on this as we've been going through it. Just it's such a critical time. This is the early robot era. We're finally starting to get the the increase in compute as well as all of the engineering that and designing that's happening in our world with robots. What would be like a really good takeaway message for people? Well, I, I think it's something we've been talking all along, but just to kind of summarize it, um, we are at a pivotal moment in, in, in human history where things that we've dreamed about and, and feared about ourselves, we actually are able to build versions of those. And what are we going to do with that? And I think we need, first of all, to understand that. And if there's no other message that gets out from this book or any discussions that you know, I might have or others, um, we need to understand that, that these aren't just like helpful AI systems that are gonna drive us around and all of that. I mean, there's a lot more going on there and they could become benevolent or malevolent. And it's up to us right now. And it, it, it is a hell of a lot of responsibility. And I'm not sure we're doing a very good job. So it's up to us to make sure that we do a good job. And it's thanks to people like you that write books like Talking to Robots that get us thinking more deeply about this transitionary era. Well, I appreciate that. Thank and you, David. Thank you so much for talking thank to you. us and coming this was on great. the show. Really appreciate it. Everyone, check out Talking to Robots. It's again, it's July 16, 2019. The link is in the bio. Check it out and have more conversations with your friends, your families, your coworkers, people online about this early robot era and how we can really maximize benevolence as we make the transition. Check out David's other links in the bio below as well. Also, support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation so we can continue doing cool things like coming to Cambridge for interviews, the links in the bio for us as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.